So we come to the next session. I, I think uh, David Rogach is the next one. Is that right? That's right. Yes. So, um, so I was set uh, to keep a brief in the introduction because it kind of uh, diminishes the time of presentation. So I would just be say only a few words. So he is a professor at university in Poznan in Poland. And uh, he's uh, author of the book, Chinese philosophy of history from ancient Confucianism to the end of the 18th century. And uh, has an, a three volume book, um, on the uh, in the making Chinese philosophy and its thinkers from ancient times to the present days that will come out next year or so. So, uh, Professor Horaj, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay, am I heard well? And yes, is yes. the <laughs> shared uh, full screen uh, mode. So, uh, uh, yes, I, my. Uh, talk my paper is a little provocative maybe uh, but this is something i came up with and i'd really like to uh listen to your feedback especially since i'm not i'm simply not any scholar of lisa ho and much less an expert in it uh, but uh, i became interested in in this hypothesis recently uh, so I will once again refer to the much discussed notion of sedimentation, Didian. Uh, and as we know, it has and may have various sources or inspirations. Clearly, it comes from the metaphor of the geological settling of layers of sand and dust. Uh, Lee himself admits that he has been inspired, he was inspired by the Piagetian theory of cognitive development and his particular understanding of, of sedimentation. And generally, he was very open to the recent discoveries coming from evolutionary psychology, paleoarchaeology. Uh, he himself speculated about the origins of uh, motor thinking, etc. Uh, but my um, detectivist genealogical uh, trope is that maybe there are some uh, at least similarities uh, between um, the concept of sedimentation and how the transformation of Alaya Vijnana is understood in Yogacara Buddhism. Uh, it's not explicit. Uh, it's not that Lee took it from Yogacara. He never mentions this type of uh, routing, which makes it even more exciting. Uh, uh, especially given the fact that Li Zeho was not particularly charitable towards Buddhism. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, epithets. So Buddhism was for him uh, often treated as an epitome of religious fanaticism, uh, an apology of suffering and an apology for suffering, which given all the circumstances uh, was also identified with sort of narcotic conducive to the maintenance of feudal society, which of course goes along uh, orthodox Marxist critic of religion. Uh, as for his presentation, History of Chinese Thought, he mainly seemed to treat Buddhism as a catalyst for the development of Chinese, particularly Confucian philosophy, rather than a subject on its own. So, so this is intriguing, of course, and goes against uh, maybe the uh, mainstream interpretation, but uh, to uh, since we are limited by time, I will also assume that we are more or less uh, acquainted with Yogacara Buddhism. So I'll just focus on the concept of storehouse consciousness, Alaya Vijnana, which basically was not invented by the Yogacharis, and many anticipations of it are to be found in other Abhidharmic schools, not to mention Brahmanical schools of philosophy. Uh, so I leave it for discussion, um, but as, as for the Alaya um, understood within Yogacara School of Philosophy or Vijnana Vada School of Philosophy, um, we can actually enlist or at least like figure out uh, four basic meanings uh, of it, and some of them could be understood or treated in more transcendental terms, other more in genetic terms. So uh, Alaya is seen as the store of the fruits of past experiences. It is also seen as the cause 
of the manifest forms of cognitive awareness. This is exactly why these fruits of past experiences are gathered at all, in order to be manifested as forms of consciousness. Then uh, Alaya is also explicitly, and by explicitly I mean uh, thesis, declarations from Mahayana Samgraha that are uh, quoted and discussed in, in the paper that has been uploaded. It is also treated as the condition of appropriation and respectively dependent existence, since uh, this existence is something that is experienced uh, in an appropriated mentally way. It is also called an embryo that literally coagulates, coagulates in some form, uh, thereby guaranteeing the psychophysical continuum and to some extent, uh, some weak sense of identity, definitely far from, let's say, an Atman of an individual, but it does uh, guarantee secure such a continuum. Uh, so basically, uh, given such a description, uh, we have to come to the conclusion that uh, each individual has her or his own alaya, but there is this problem. If it is reflexive consciousness, manas vijnana, that creates the image, false image of one's ego, so that the self, I, is not to be found in the alaya itself, then why to suppose alaya is individually differentiated? And this sort of theoretical doubt or question uh, make it made it possible uh, for an encounter between Yogacara Buddhism and Tathagatagarbha tradition. So, for instance, for famous Lankavatara Sutra, Alaya is perfectly one. Uh, it is um, viewed as an unconditional absolute, the noetic aspect of suchness, Tathata, or simply the universal mind, within some sort of quotation marks, as it is clearly not the subjective mind. So how does anything of that uh, has to do with, with Lisa Ho's concept of sedimentation? Again, I will assume that, <coughs> sorry, that we are more or less familiar, actually more definitely than me, uh, with this idea of sedimentation. Uh, so I will try to uh, shed a light on these ideas that will be crucial for my comparison. So um, for Lee, uh, the supposedly, supposedly universal, necessary, a priori structures of subjective cognition, uh, as we of course read from his critique of critical philosophy, are rather achievements or fruits of the historical experience of humanity. Uh, so this is the way he uh, Mm, overturns or uh, massively reinterprets and historicizes uh, the transcendental philosophy. And, and he explicitly also uses this formulation, uh, 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 that is the enduring forms of experience uh, can be and are transformed into the transcendental. They are being transcendentalized, which means that we're dealing here with a historicization of the transcendental. But as, as it was mentioned uh, before, actually quite a few times, that um, also entails that there is no bifurcation between uh, the conditioned and the unconditioned, right? So it's not just um, leveling down the transcendental, but still it holds some priority and uh, could be seen as um, not conditioned in any way further, let's say. Uh, we are uh, rather blurring the lines and uh, transcending this, uh, to some extent, dualistic perspective. Uh, and of course, this also means that uh, with, with um, a, an emphasis put on the experience of humanity, that collective subjectality uh, shapes individual subjectivity to uh, Guanxin. So what it means for, um, what it means for Li's genealogy of subjectivity, it of course means that, um, as again, it was discussed today, it goes, uh, it is twofold. Uh, we are dealing with both naturalization of humans seen in this way and humanization of nature. So I will focus on the second one. Uh, just, this is just but a summary, of course. Uh, Lee uh, believes that um, also this humanization of nature is uh, in a certain sense twofold. Uh, we, are, uh, we have uh, humanization, the process of the humanizing of external nature, which yields, which leads to the emergence of technical social structures, uh, if we may translate it that way, and of course of an inner nature, 
uh, which uh, in Lee's eyes is a very necessary yet omitted supplement to uh, and contribution uh, to the Marxist and Marxist-like determinism, namely uh, the emergence of cultural psychic formations, which are to a no less degree determinant, or uh, if we don't like that word, crucial uh, in the process of the formation of subjectivity. And uh, Lee is not speaking about any experience uh, whatsoever. Uh, he's focusing on a very specific type of experience that in his eyes and in my eyes, in his eyes, uh, is um, constitutive uh, during that process, namely the manufacturing and use of tools. Uh, and this process shapes our cognitive abilities by our, I mean, human. And But I didn't want to use human here because it actually makes us human. Uh, it's not just that, um, just as in the case of the crit critic of critical philosophy, it's not just that our categories of cognition uh, are shaped in that way, but uh, the very idea of transcendental, okay. I will go forward. So we as subjects are shaped in that way, not only our equipment. Uh, and uh, this sedimentation is, as, as we also know, supplemented and followed by cultural and individual one. And uh, in his philosophy of culture and technology, uh, Lee applies his um, epistemological findings he des uh, describes, of course, elementary sedimentation uh, during his discussion of the function of shamanist ritual activities, which he sees in more or less the same mode of tr transforming and humanizing nature as, uh, as technology. Uh, and on that occasion, he distinguishes between the collective consciousness, the greater self that is logically and historically prior to the individual or small or smaller self, Shaowo. Uh, and this is the process that then just uh, is imbued with emergently, uh, qualitatively different forms and shapes. And in historical ontology in particular, Lee focuses on the, the process of the manufacturing and use of tools and uh, explicitly identifies it as a variant of variant form of measuring, of measuring. And uh, for him, such practices are free within the limits of the level of technological development, although they are necessary in the long scale, in the long durée. And uh, post factum, this is not an uh, a pluralistic necessity which he explicitly denounces. So, since I have no time or virtually no time, I will move to this maybe schematic but still uh, list of similarities and differences between these two approaches. So, what, what they have in common? The process they describe sedimentation or transformation of the layer stores human experiences and shapes collective memory. Secondly, uh, experiences are seen as coming from free actions entailing moral, moral responsibility, right? Uh, free. Uh, both system use, uh, systems use similar imagery, uh, similar metaphors of seeds, of, of uh, coagulation, sedimentation. Uh, result of this process for uh, is seen, uh, is identified or tantamount to uh, manifest forms of consciousness or psychic formations for Lee. Uh, five. What is transformed or sedimented is actually the self, the individual subject. Six, introducing, uh, we, we uh, both uh, systems, both conceptions introduce logically prior communal form of consciousness, be it alaya or dawa. Seven, uh, generation of subject is here understood in both transcendental and genetic or psychoontological terms, and they both operate with a long duration scale. I hope I have a minute. Uh, I'll try to make it. So as for the differences, again, this may be a little scholastic, but just forgive me due to the time I have. The difference is, of course, that no matter how much we interpret Yogacara Buddhism, it is idealist philosophy, even if transcendental, uh, the phenomena are constituted as phenomena, as meaningful phenomena due to consciousness and not reversely, which Lisa Ho openly rejects. For Yogacara, we are dealing mostly, uh, oh, sorry, it's, it's, Re reversely, we have acts mostly non instrumental. Uh, and for Lidze Ho, uh, we are talking rather about practice and mostly use of tools. So it's not just that we have actions uh, here and here. Uh, for Yogacara, there exists definitely an unconditioned realm of being. Lidze Ho uh, holds a one world view, as he puts it, historicist view, of course. 
In Yogacara, uh, this is very crucial difference. Seeds from a person's own acts are transmitted to the next lives of that individual. Whereas for Lizeho, the faculties of subjects like contemporary subjects result from the collective long-term practice of humanity. Now, this is a big difference. For Yogacara, there is no necessary improvement. Uh, we can transmit our bad karma. Uh, Lizeho sees uh, this process as a development, progress, amelioration, gailian. In Yogacara, of course, the whole idea is supplemented with a soteriological perspective, which Lee lacks. Uh, he's rather offering an interdisciplinary interpretation of human phenomena. And uh, as for soteriology in Yogacara, it is uh, somehow seen as a dis disruption, uh, escape from the stream of seeds and karma. This is our goal. Lisa Ho, even if we think that revolution, Marxist revolution, is somehow a counterpart of the Buddhist and Christian, let's say, idea of liberation and salvation, then Lisa Ho also disagrees with Yogacara on that point, as all disruptive forms of liberation are rejected by him in Gaudi Gemin as utopian, counter-effective, and simply dangerous. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Rogac. Yeah, very interesting comparison here. <clears throat> I look forward to the discussion. Now we come to uh, next speaker, uh, Professor Nylon. Professor Nylon is a famous American uh, sonologist, professor at Berkeley University. Uh, she writes in three disciplines, early empires in China, Han and pre-Han mostly, uh, philosophy, as well as art and archaeology. Uh, research interests uh, include early China and its modern reception, warring states, Eastern Han, and her books. Uh, uh, you heard already her familiarity with uh, Yang Xiong, so she has a book, The Canon of Supreme Mystery by Yang Xiong, a translation and discussion of his writing as well as the shifting center, the original great plan from the shooting and later readings and many other books, the art of war translation. So here we have a very competent uh, interpreter of uh, Chinese tradition. We look forward to your paper. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say, use one word of my 15 minutes to say, um, I'm a bit distressed and I want to offer my apologies to the members of the conference. Um, through a miscommunication, uh, no doubt my fault, um, um, this conference and my tutors, my Cambridge tutors, 100th birthday, are happening simultaneously. So what I'm trying to do is move between um, events and I will have to go out. Um, I'm actually hosting people for lunch and for dinner. So um, I'm, please forgive me. I'm not the kind of American academic who just zooms in and thinks you all should be wowed and then you leave and, um, you know, uh, but uh, in this case, uh, there will be zooming out as well as zooming in. So that's my apologies. Um, let me begin by sharing my screen. Um, and I hope this is going to work. Um, I should be on the desktop able to find it. Um, yeah, this is uh, Lisa Ho. Come on, open. open. Great. It's a new computer, so it's also a bit of a difficulty for me. Um, a new computer as of yesterday. So um, um, it's been an eventful week. Okay, um, I would like to give my 15 minutes. And if anyone read my paper um, or saw my 25 oh, minute sorry. talk, we can oh. see your PowerPoint. You can't see it because I can see it. You are screen sharing. That's yes. what it says. Yes, but it's not sharing the PowerPoint. You're just sharing the desktop. Ah, let me, let me try one down. That doesn't help. Yeah. That doesn't help. Yeah. Okay. I believe I sent you my latest yes. version, Maya, but yes. I'll have to say, please change the screen. Sorry about that. Okay, can you stop sharing yours, please? Okay. I believe that's the latest version of it. Yeah, I sent it this morning or last yeah. night, this morning. Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. So, um, yes, I said if anything could go wrong, it will go wrong. <laughs> so anyway, here we are. Um, I begin my 15 minutes. Um, could we have the next uh, screen, please? Um, I begin with a confession. I, I worked hard on my essay, but there were so many things that I needed to learn in order to put together the three topics that I wanted to put together, which was um, the effect of early Marxism on Li Zaho, um, the events uh, surrounding Chen Anman, and then the post Chen Anman understanding of Li Zaho, that when I finished my paper, I felt very unsatisfied with it. Um, and I'm still not satisfied with today's talk, but I think I understand a little bit more. Um, and as a historian, we always want to know um, uh, when we're addressing a, a singular person in Chinese history as much as possible about what influences um, he experienced and absorbed. And so um, my talk today will be a bit, uh, quite a bit more about the Sino-Soviet influences on Li Zaho. Um, and I'm still processing. I don't read Russian, so I'm still trying to process what I can. Um, through other languages. Um, and I'm happy to leave Marx entirely aside for the moment uh, because so many people were dealing with early Marx and they know it so much better than I do. Um, and so um, I'm going to take off. May I have the next screen, please? Okay, there are two common treatments of Li Zaho, I think. One is this disembodied genius who, in quotes, went his own way in developing his theories about Chinese society, experiences, and aesthetics. Um, and then, um, um, and this is particularly true in America, um, as a theorist who uh, initially enabled and encouraged the events at Tiananmen, but after its failure became somehow a cultural conservative. Um, and I was really distressed to see this in reading after reading, mostly of Chinese scholars who had settled in the United States. Um, and mostly um, they wished Li to take a more radical stance, something more like uh, Liu Xiaobo, um, the Nobel Prize winning dissident. So I'm here to say that I think Li never became a radical, uh, never was not a radical. He was a radical provocateur. And I think that's different than Liu Xiaobo. So I want to treat him as a historical phenomenon, a sedimented individual himself who showed the impact of society upon his work um, and um, then um, that of others down through history. Um, as I would see it, Lee's work grew ever more complex over time, but he never abandoned his basic stance, which was pro-science and pro-democracy. Um, moreover, he remained convinced that Chinese particularities could eventually lead um, to a richer sense of universalism, both in China and abroad. Um, I think my own um, talk today comes out of my dislike of Chinese hyperpatriotism. I don't like American hyperpatriotism either, and Chinese exceptionalism. And I think here my approach would tally with Li's approach. Many post Tiananmen leaders in the CCP, as well as many new Confucians have dramatically reduced the complexity of what it means to be Chinese. Whereas Li Zihou, to my mind, was always interested in demonstrating the complexity and richness of Chinese culture. So for these reasons, I'm going to argue that the two most common treatments of Li that I have stumbled across um, are not uh, correct. Um, next slide, please. So the key problems in both history and in philosophy are how to cinify Marxism. I think I don't need to explain how bizarre Marx's idea of Asiatic production was, um, completely ignorant of realities in China. Um, the second question would be to how to deploy aesthetics to maximize the power of the CCP line. 
um, how to create a Maoist aesthetics that was true for most of Lee's life, and what should the role of the vanguard of the proletariat be. These are the problems everyone is grappling with as Lee himself is coming to maturity. Um, I think I won't need to go through Hegel and Kant here because many people know far more about that than I do. Um, next slide, please. What I want to say is there were two immediate responses in Beijing to the 1949 revolution. One was by the Peking University History Department. And to avoid the imposition of the Marxist unilinear historical schema, which fit Chinese history very badly, the Beida historians of early China came up with um, and fought for successfully the notion of China as the oldest continuous civilization. This was not uh, totally absent before, but now there's a concerted attack, um, uh, sorry, attempt, concerted attempt um, by the Peking University faculty um, to push this line. Um, and when we turn to philosophy departments, um, what we see, and most of us know this quite well, are vigorous debates on aesthetics. Um, and perhaps I'm a bit too harsh when I called Tsai Yi and Huang Yaomian um, uh, party hacks, um, but uh, basically what they were doing was attacking Zhu Guangxian uh, for what they called his German-inspired idealist aesthetics. Um, Zhu responded with refining his own treatments, and then, of course, enter stage right. We get Li Zihou at the age of 26, entering into these debates with figures far senior to himself. Um, and um, not always, many people think he won the debate. I wouldn't say so, um, but um, I, I do think um, from then on, um, he is thinking quite deeply about the relation between aesthetics and revolution. Um, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so um, what I would like to add to some of the discussions that I read, I read all of your papers and I'll probably send you comments. Um, anyway, as I hope you'll send me comments on what I'm saying. Um, what was very big in China at the time that Li Zihou is coming to maturity um, were three Russian thinkers whose works were translated from Russian into Chinese. And uh, I've only begun to delve into these. The only one I really knew was Chernyshevsky. Um, but um, anyway, these were well known to anyone in philosophy um, because they were called quasi-Marxists or proto-Marxists, which simply meant that Marx was influenced by all of them. Um, and um, these were quite well known in China at the time. Next slide, please. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time. I was just going to give you a little bit more background. Um, I was reading right as I was preparing this paper, uh, George Lukash and um, his studies of European realism. And though I don't agree with all he has to say, I think he has some very interesting things to say um, about the influence of these Russians on Marxists, both in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. Um, all of these Russian theorists um, would in some sense describe themselves as followers and also as critics of Feuerbach. Um, and what they keep insisting upon um, is basically this statement from Feuerbach that our ideal should not be a castrated, disembodied, denuded creature. Our ideal should be a whole, real, many-sided, complete, and fully developed man. Um, for those who deal in early China and the associations of beauty, um, may, or excellence, um, um, the word that is often glossed in the early commentaries is to be whole, to be a chen. Um, and so I think this is something that Li Zihou would have picked up on very easily and naturally. 
Um, one of the things that Lukash also insists upon is that all of the three Russian theorists were wily writers. They had to avoid the censors um, while using their um, apparently literary criticism to persuade members of the liberal bourgeoisie to think more critically about their relation to the powers that be. Consistency, Lukash says, was never their main goal. To persuade people in shifting circumstances was the goal. Um, and here, my own reading in political philosophy would emphasize um, that um, all the great thinkers, and I've just listed one or two here, um, uh, um, uh, in, um, in political philosophy, in the Anglo-American tradition, would say the trouble with academics is uh, they are into purity. Um, they don't understand how politics works. Um, and I grew up in a political family, and I think that's right. You're not looking for consistency. You're looking for alliance building in the real world. Next slide, please. I hope I've got a next slide. Maya's, Maya's, um, um, thank you. Um, I would like to say that Li Zaho is a wily revolutionary democratic himself. He drew deeply from the Russians um, and they being materialists who use literary criticism to critique autocrats in power. As, and he knew as Hannah Arendt and others knew that politics itself is a kind of theater, an aesthetic exercise. Um, Li Zaho is asking the question, what precisely is Chinese culture after all the depredations of Chinese history and especially those of the 20th century? And somehow in all his writings, the only, um, as I would see it, consistency as he's tacking back and forth, um, responding to major events, usually um, terrible events in Chinese history, um, is that he manages always to avoid both the intellectualization of art and the mechanical politicization of art. To my mind, he is the supreme agent provocateur. Um, and what I'd like to say is that a much younger generation, Siji Wei, uh, writing on democracy in China, the common crisis, he comes up with exactly the same set of questions and no better answers um, than can be offered because the situation in China is continually changing. Um, and that means the, provoc the provocation um, will have to be um, continually changing uh, to come up with something that is both recognizably Chinese and also recognizably will push things in the, in the direction of democracy. I think maybe I have one more slide, Maya. Ah, no, I have two more slides. Um, I do, if you haven't seen it recently, um, urge you to go um, visit, revisit the, the great movie by Jean-Luc Godard. Um, uh, one must confront uh, vague ideas uh, with clear images. Um, and um, I think that's what Li Zaho is always trying to say. Let's get out of the vagaries. Let's get into the concrete. Um, my, uh, my last slide, I think. Yeah, oh, I've got two more, sorry. Um, the labels don't count as far as Li Zaho um, um, uh, would say. Uh, what he's looking for is something that's recognizably Chinese. Um, and what I would say he's looking for is this in-between space, um, knowing that even residing in that in-between space of other people's theories, and sometimes even his own theories, um, that's not going to work either. Um, um, uh, there's no way to avoid troubles and entanglements as long as language is in play. But if a person were to float along with the ancestors of the myriad things, 
treating things as themselves, but not being used as a mere thing by other things, how would a person ever be entangled and burdened? This is the model we get from Shen Nong and the Yellow Emperor. Um, so um, I think that's what we get to. Next slide, please. Yeah, um, this explains why Li increasingly over time adopts Zhuangzi. Um, he's not eschewing politics by any means, but he says for the moment, if nothing else is possible, um, let us live well, let us listen well to the situations at hand, and let us dream how to get to a better future. Um, I think that's more or less it. Yes, there are different ways to be true to Chineseness. Um, I was pleased to see that you don't have to forget Chineseness um, to be um, pushing for a much richer and more adaptable idea of what is global philosophy. Um, and I rest my case there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nalan, for your interesting talk. And we turn now to our third, last speaker of this panel, to uh, uh, Professor Carleo III. Uh, he is professor at Fudan University, uh, and he got his PhD at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He has become an expert on Li Zhe translating, uh, particularly uh, Li Zhe Ho's The Origins of Chinese Thought from Shamanism and Ritual Regulations to Humaneness. That was uh, awarded Outstanding Academic Title of 2019 by the American Library Association's magazine Choice. And he has a volume coming out very soon, The Humanist Ethics of Li Zhe Ho. It's yours, Robert. <laughs> All right. Bobby. Thank you, Professor Pohl. Um, and thank you, um, Maya and Yana and Roger for organizing. Um, I'm going to try to share my screen now. Um, one quick correction. I am not a professor at Fudan. I got my master's degree at Fudan. Um, so I am currently <laughs> visiting professor at Wesleyan uh, University here in the States um, for this semester. Um, and this has been a really, um, I've really enjoyed all of the presentations so far. So it's uh, so great that this was put together. Um, really interesting um, stuff. I didn't get to start at three o'clock, but I tried to start at five o'clock a.m. our time. So I, I caught the last few panels. Um, so it's been a lot of fun. And this in particular has been quite colorful. Uh, we've had the Buddhist side of Li Zhe um, the Zhuangist side of Li Zhe and Marxist side. and. Um, now I'm going to try to do some of the Confucian and liberal sides of Li Zhe um, So a wily character indeed, I think, Professor Nachman. Um, I predict I've been wanting to work on um, Li Zhe theory of emotion as substance for a while, um, partly because um, it's uh, so um, kind of a wily turn of phrase. I think it's often and easily misunderstood. Um, so I'm going to attempt to explain it um, today. Um, principally through Li Zhe theory of sedimentation, right? I think it helps us better grasp what, what Li Zhe is really getting at with emotion as substance. In fact, I think they're more or less uh, different dimensions or different ways of saying the same thing. Or that's how he intended them. I'm going to try to explain this as a version of Confucian concrete humanism specifically. Um, and I'll explain what that means and why I think it's important. Um, so all of that. And then after, I want to kind of show where this theory leads us, where it goes. Um, so it supports uh, what is a pretty innovative um, and impressive achievement, affirming both ethical relativism and ethical absolutism within one theory. Um, and also what I'm going to call humane liberality, uh, combine, combining Confucian humaneness, um, basic, uh, a Confucian framework with an affirmation of liberal morals and principles, which is also quite an achievement, I think. Um, so I'll go through this as quickly as I can. Um, sedimentation um, leads to host theory that um, reason, in addition to morality, um, morality being part of our reason, I guess, um, is culturally sedimented. And I like the metaphor of a river um, as a way to understand some of the most important thing that 
things that Professor Lee was getting at here. So sedimentation in a river, um, we can think of it as forming the bedrock, the riverbed, um, as well as the banks of the river. So literally sedimentation is giving the shape of the river and determines the form of the river, right? Um, but the river itself is what sediments its bedrock and forms its shape and is constantly doing this through flow. So the shape of the river yesterday um, is not the shape of the river today, but the shape of the river today is a uh, founded on the shape of the river yesterday as it flowed through. Um, so um, in a sense, we can understand ourselves as living within this river of reason and morality um, and part of its flow, um, both shaped by and also shaping the river. Um, we can compare this view of reason and morality uh, with probably the more common and familiar view of discovering cosmic truths, right? Um, patterns of the universe, heavenly patterns, um, however you want to put it, that are kind of universally valid um, in, in whatever way that is, um, and absolute, right? And the sedimented model is quite different from this. Um, here, all of our morals and reason are inherited uh, within our culture, and so they're culturally relative, um, so they're historical and contingent. I want to just briefly mention that it's perfectly plausible to have both models at the same time. Um, you can make a compatibility between them very easily um, by saying that the cultural inheritance is how we accumulate knowledge of discovered truths, right? I think that um, helps capture what's kind of appealing about both models. Um, so we could have a theory of sedimentation as accumulation of this kind of moral wisdom, this um, discovery, um, accumulation of discovered cosmic um, understanding. Uh, and I bring this up precisely to point out that this is not Lietze Ho's view, right? Um, so to distinguish that particular possibility from what I want to call his concrete humanism, in which there is no absolute um, unchanging um, moral truth um, and morals and reason, uh, are themselves products of sedimentation. So they're historically formed. And this means that the moral project is not one of discovery or of purification and clear perception, um, but rather um, founded in a view where humans are ourselves the source of morality. Um, so this is my proposal. Um, these are two camps that I'm distinguishing or attempting to distinguish. And I think it captures um, some important parts of what Lee Professor Lee himself um, would have tried to oppose uh, his view to and does contrast his view to. I give um, the opposing camp the label cosmic idealism. I don't know if that's the best term, but it's, uh, I think it's the best I've come up with so far to capture um, what is distinct about the kind of neo Confucian, the Song, Song Ming Confucian kind of view that Li Zihou rejects and its modern inheritors, um, Li Zihou's main target of criticism, Mo Zong San, um, which have this kind of idea of um, looking to something beyond humanity and the moral project being one of um, purifying and aligning perhaps with that or embodying um, something uh, more cosmic um, and abstract. We can see Professor Li kind of, and I think he may, see in some sense himself as falling within a different tradition that's maybe not as widely said, but a, a very long important um, stream of Confucian uh, thinking that is concrete humanism. Uh, he could be aligned with Xu Fu Guan, also a major critic of Mo Zong San's moral metaphysics, right? This kind of metaphysical way. Um, I think Liang Shuming also has this concrete humanist um, dynamic to his interpretation of Confucian morality as shaped by um, where right and wrong are shaped by um, what caring within human relationships. Um, Dai Zhen is a trenchant critic of the Song Ming Confucian model um, and in certain ways um, telling us to look specifically to human emotions within concrete relationships and the um, patterning of human feelings and relationships in the actual world in rejecting the kind of cosmic idealism. So a longstanding kind of stream or strain of Confucian thought here. Um, And I want to point out that emotion as substance is a different way of getting at this exact theory. And I think one of the easiest ways to understand it and most effective is this very simplistic model that Li Zihou gives, um, the basic schema, not the more complex schema of his ethics, which captures the idea of sedimentation um, and this kind of concrete humanism. And we'll notice that the kind of middle two elements here, um, ritual and reason, um, or kind of ritual regulations and maybe moral principle um, in a different aspect. Um, 
which uh, Professor Jiad discussed uh, earlier, as well as um, ethics and morality uh, in, in a sense. Um, they're flanked on both sides by qing, right? By emotion, right? Um, so when we understand emotion as substance, I think this is a good model for approaching it. Now, how is this supposed to work? Um, the qing or emotionality here on the left side um, gives rise to kind of social patterns um, and norms, right? And then of course, um, as we move further right on this graph, uh, we have reason as it's kind of internalized as these social norms, and then all the way that reason then governs emotions within the individual. Um, so on the left side, we have um, social practices, and on the right side, we have kind of more personal um, and internalized um, dimensions of moral psychology or human psychology. And so the emotionality on the left, why is it Qing? It's not individual feelings. And Li is very clear, he states over and over again, um, this Qing is a Qing that includes feelings, um, but it's felt social lived collective experience. That is the basis for developing patterns of social life and therefore moving all the way to the left, then patterning individual morality. And of course, it, the individual morality is part of the broader social felt and lived experience. Um, so emotion here, um, we have very explicit explanation of it being both um, qinggan, um, feelings, right? And also qingjing, uh, qingkuang. Uh, so we understand that as what is substance, what Li Zihou means when he's saying emotion as substance. But what does he mean as substance? Well, within this concrete humanist framework, um, it is very much the source, right? The ultimate um, fundamental kind of source of human life um, and reality. Um, but we can have to understand this kind of in contrast to perhaps more common um, and more familiar ways of understanding um, substance uh, as noumena, noumenon, or um, something that's ultimate but beyond as in the cosmic idealism model or the way that benti is often used in uh, Chinese philosophy, um, especially modern philosophy, post-Kant. Um, and so we can understand this way of understanding benti or substance as a rejection of those more familiar ways of understanding it. And this is what Lee himself says, right? So this theory of benti is actually a theory that's rejecting traditional conceptions of benti. Um, so my argument is that basically this theory of sedimentation, um, which puts morality as um, based, bases morality in the felt experience of social life um, and places that as the original substance, um, which patterns us um, and our reason. This is how we should understand emotion as substance um, rather than maybe more surface level um, misunderstandings, which claim that um, somehow feelings or individual feelings are, have some sort of um, access to a transcendent truth um, as it has been misunderstood by contemporary scholars. Um, so moving forward, what does this give us? It gives us a theory of relativism, of course, but not anything goes relativism. So the relativity here is the recognition that no moral principles will be valid across the large range of human conditions, uh, cultural, different cultural cultures um, have different kinds of institutions, different historical periods have different technologies, so they're shaped differently. And morality is actually part of those conditions of human life, right? Our shared social norms and beliefs. Um, and only within any particular kind of set of conditions can we affirm what's right or wrong or good and bad. Right? And so we should move away from seeing these standards as universal and their absoluteness rooted in some sort of universality um, and instead consider good and bad, right and wrong in particular circumstance. Um, now, relativism seems to usually deny absolutism. Um, Li Zihou is very careful to distinguish two forms of absolutism within his theory. Um, one is internal to individual psychology. And this is the formal force of what he calls the will, right? Um, now, this determines for us um, when something's right, then we act on it. When something's good, then we act on it, right? But the particular content of those ideas are relative, right? They're um, um, different people have different ideas of good and bad, right and wrong, and those will shape um, kind of, those will be substantively action guiding. They'll determine the direction that our absolute will takes to go. Now, this sort of internal absoluteness is universal. It's just something that every human being has, right? Um, it's part of our psychology. And so Li Tzuho says, well, in this sense, terrorists also possess morality 
Um, the problem is that their morality or the particular conceptions of good and bad that they have adopted are wrong, right? They're bad, absolutely bad. And so this leads us to the second form of absolutism, which is that of external ethics, um, or in other words, absolutism about people's beliefs about right or wrong, good or bad. Now, within any particular situation, Li Tzu Ho is saying, um, Professor Lee affirms that within a per, given a certain conditions, we can affirm that some morals, some beliefs, some actions are objectively absolutely good and others are bad, right? And he determines this by whether they contribute to human flourishing. So when things obstruct human flourishing, um, they can be deemed absolutely bad and we should reject them. Um, and things can be good if there are these kinds of morals um, help us. And this means we're always looking to the existential value that a set of morals has to actual humans, um, how it's shaping the flow of the river, so to speak. So what is good today? Well, liberal individualism. And so we see that um, Li Ho has come all the way around through Confucianism to affirm liberalism in a very unique way, uh, a project that um, th philosophers, especially Confucian philosophers, have taken on for the last um, century or so, um, and I th think um, with varying degrees of success, and this is, I think, a pretty good proposal. Um, so precisely on this basis, Professor Lee affirms um, modern social morals, as he puts it, um, the basic principles and values of liberal individualism, um, and he does this through Confucian relationism, right? So the broader framework is a Confucian framework, but the specific good for today is um, human rights, um, perhaps institutions of democracy, um, respect for one another, equality, um, freedoms, because he believes these things are good. They promote human flourishing. However, the conditions of human life or modern human life right now um, may change, right? Technologies are developing very rapidly. Um, cultural values and institutions can go wrong. Um, beliefs can change. And so as we move forward and we move forward at a breakneck pace, uh, we can't blindly adhere to what's been working in the past. We have to very critically evaluate um, when and how our morality um, should flow forward, um, should um, continue to be revised so that um, um, when we face um, questions of world hunger, climate change, global health, artificial intelligence, um, genetic technologies, animal rights, uh, robot rights, um, the use of social media, all of these things we'll have to think very long and hard about when and how um, any morality, including um, first and foremost liberal individualism, but not limited to it, um, will be humane in the Confucian sense of um, contributing to the well-being of people. Um, so we'll have to navigate all of this, um, all of these changes. Um, and um, I believe that this is a, a very constructive outlook for moving forward, I would say. I have been very um, impressed by how this um, serves to potentially kind of mitigate a lot of the fears around liberal individualism. Um, what Professor Ames, what Henry Rosemont has been so concerned about, um, Confucian humane liberality will allow us to rein in excesses and problems while affirming what's good about of the tradition. Um, so we can move forward as good Confucian liberals. Um, so thank you so much. I will conclude there. Thank you also, Robert, for your interesting talk. And now we'll have a discussion period of 45 minutes or well, wrong. Please uh, raise your hands, come up with your comments. Yes, please, Professor Li Chen Yang. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for um, Professor Michael Nairn. Nairn, um, good to see you, Michael. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if it's a question or a comment. Um, I do resonate with your uh, last slide that this is kind of in between this. And if you look at Li Ho's last years, uh, he walked on a tight rope. On the one hand, he has a strong cultural responsibility, strong sense of cultural responsibility. He wanted to promote 
as uh, you know, Bobby said, the human rights and the individual liberty, uh, those ideals. On the other hand, uh, he did not go as far as, as you mentioned, Liu Xiaobo and the other people one day in the Wang Jintao in the US. So he was able to go back to China to visit and even give academic talks. Yet he definitely was not considered you know, party's man. So for many years, he really worked on the same line there without the falling in a way. Now, I would have thought he has a strong sense of being a Taoist, Johnson, and a Confucian. But you end your talk with more of a kind of a Johnson reading of Li Zihou. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to hear your comment on that, what I just shared with you, and why we don't say he is a kind of a Confucian slash Bronson rather than end up with talking about a Bronson type of uh, style. Um, Thank you. Professor Lee, as you know, I'm one of the people who says there's very little difference in the early period um, between. Um, what are erroneously called schools um, by analogy to the Greek um, situation in classical Greece. Um, and uh, who are the two closest thinkers in my mind, Shunza and Zhuangzi? Uh, Shunza, of course, says that Zhuangzi is closest to Mengzi. Um, and so I think one doesn't need um, one could, I ended with Zhuangzi because I think he's so much more often um, treated as a Confucian, but by people who tend to have a very narrow view of what Confucian means. Um, and I think from reading Li Zihou's uh, Lun Yu Jindu, every single page of it, um, what he is not doing is confining his notions um, to what many people would say, oh, this is in the box of Confucian thinking. Um, what that entire book does is explode our notion of even um, what is possible um, in commentary to the Analects. And I think um, in a way, as a historian, I spent most of my time saying, isn't it wonderful he laid out for us the difference between what are Han commentaries and Song commentaries and Ming commentaries, and then early modern and his own. But of course, what he's simultaneously showing us there um, is that these are all quite good ways to be Chinese, and there need to be conversations between these different ways of being Chinese. So um, partly I ended with Zhuangzi because Zhuangzi is so associated with this in-between state, but we can find it quite often in readings that are not uh, Zhuangzi. Um, and um, I think what I'm most interested in is this sensibility that if one is to engage in politics, um, one must, if one hopes to persuade anyone, one must begin to look for common ground and to begin to uh, forge alliances through which one begins to shape um, one's allies' ways of thinking and acting. But for me, what I love about Li Zaho is it's all about effective action, how to get us to that point. Um, and so that's my preoccupation. And I would say the same is true of Zhuangzi. Um, I did a close study of Zhuangzi and Xunzi, and there are actually whole passages in the Xunzi that are taken either from Zhuangzi or they're both taking them from a mutual third source. But the point is there's quite a bit of overlap in the thinking. And I think that's why Xunzi is so incredibly sophisticated because he's absorbing all these masters and different uh, streams. I'm not sure they're even differentiated very well um, in the Han period because all of the masters say, I'm borrowing this, I'm borrowing this, I'm borrowing this, and this makes me a greater master 
And that's what Shunza had to say, and that's what Yangsheng had to say. So we don't have this Song dynasty. Let's differentiate um, these streams one from the other. Yeah. So I was Thank trying you. to be a wily provocateur myself um, in to get us to rethinking our labels. So anyway. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Jana. I see your hand being raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have two um, short comments to um, David Terogaj and then also to Bobby. Uh, and I'm wondering, shall I first just say both of them and then they reply if they want to reply or they, yeah. Okay, first, uh, they, um, David. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think that um, I, I I don't quite or I respectively disagree <laughs> <laughs> with the uh, with the notion that you know in Lisa how the, um, the this relation between empirical and transcendental is to a certain degree dualistic. Uh, I think a dualistic is a model that is uh, based uh, actually on divisions between matter and idea and uh, all other or other divisions that proceed or object and subject and so on. And it is a model that is based, that functions uh, on the basis of the concept, static concept of being, and also the laws of formal logic. So uh, it is a very strict model, actually, the dualistic model. So I, I find it difficult to imagine something to be dualistic to a certain degree. Something is either dualistic or it is not dualistic. You, you, you get my, uh, what I mean? And then, uh, but it is certainly a binary, a dual uh, model, you see. Uh, Leads the house uh, conceptualization of transcendental being transformed into the empirical is a dual model, but it is not a dualistic. Uh, model. That's a difference. Yes, that's uh, because, yeah. yeah, because it is uh, uh, based on the processual uh, philosophy, on the processual paradigm, on the pro processual worldview, and this makes uh, actually a very big difference. And the second thing I was um, I was pondering about when is your main uh, hypothesis? I mean, your comparison is very good it, it's splendid and it, it, it uh, tells us a lot about your white expertise really i enjoyed it a lot i learned a lot about it but i think that this uh, underlying hypothesis uh, should be should be eliminated or replaced by another hypothesis because i think that you know you cannot um, it is true there are so many similarities between sedimentation and uh, this store of consciousness Many, many, but um, it is not a, because of this. Lidze Hall was consciously or unconsciously influenced by Yogacara uh, Buddhism, you know, because uh, not every overlapping, not every correlation is uh, causality uh, already. So, you know, you, uh, I mean, the, I think that the clue is that they both Yogacara and uh, the Yogacara consciousness and sedimentation were both rooted on the same paradigms, which are very similar and to which were also uh, implied in Confucianism. So that's why you can say, for instance, the sedimentation is uh, influenced by the Confucian classics and by Taoist classic, by the I Ching. If you if you want, but not that I think this is problematic to say that he um, that he was influenced consciously or unconscious. They just proceeded from the same paradigms, I think. But that can be easy easily somehow transformed because the whole comparison. I th I think it really uh, it really says a lot, and I have learned, and it is precious. I, we should um, we should anyway uh, keep it uh, in the ontology May because it is 
quickly yeah. because I, yeah. I'm afraid I will forget. Like, thank you for that. Uh, I I was referring to the like leads a host own declaration that he upholds this uh this one world view but i was yeah. personally skeptical uh, about the way it is so let's say unison or holistic because this mechanism in itself it presupposes what you say maybe not dualism but some sort of uh binary complementary dynamics so i yeah. I'm, ag I'm agreeing with that and that helps mm -hmm. a lot in in uh, positing him in a proper way uh, as for yogachara I said it, it is provocative. Personally, I don't know what to do with these similarities. And I'm trying to figure it out. Um, I still think that me, he may have been inspired in the sense that uh, 20th century Chinese philosophy was uh, to a large degree um, influenced by Yogacara, um, Confucianism too, and that these lines are blurred precisely at that point, and Professor John Makeham can tell us a lot about uh, the scale of that influence. Uh, mm -hmm. He is also criticizing very harshly, too harshly, like uncharitably, Zhang Kaiyan, who made a philosophical historical use out of Yogacara, and I'm referring to, 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 to the, this, uh, his uh, assessment of Zhang Kaiyan in the paper. So I think there, there may be something out there. And my experience with Western philosophers is that they are very good in covering their tracks. Uh, <laughs> Heidegger is the master, absolutely, uh, in that art. But but he's not the only one. So that but but I'm not definitely uh, eligible to you know raise the thesis that uh, something is going on. But I think that there is some sort of intellectual climate of discussions, even at least, or thinking about the subject that may be absorbed from like earlier generations of masters or uh, Confucians. Of course, we all don't know where our inspirations come from concretely, right? So yes. it is, so you, you cannot exclude that. But I think that the, the hypothesis that this was directly the influence yeah. of your father is uh, somehow too quick, too quick. Yep. Um, but, but basically, of course, we agree in everything. I kindly, I kindly agree. <laughs> I respectively <laughs> agree. Okay, uh, let's, um, I would just like to also say a, a short remark on, um, uh, Bobby, on Bobby's uh, presentation, uh, and I have a question um, regarding Bobby's presentation. First, the the comment. Uh, I think that um, uh, I liked your explanation and you know and your definition and interpretation of this double meaning uh, and different connotations of the term "ching," um, because it is very important for the understanding of his philosophy and also epistemology the theory of perception but uh, and and i think that you have uh, in your recorded presentation you have also uh, very nicely explained it with uh, uh, with the chinese connotations in chinese but uh, i think that this situational and changing nature of uh, ching is better expressed by the term ching quang than only by only by Ching Jing, because um, because uh, Ching Kuang is uh, even more contextual. I think that Ching Jing is referring to a certain concrete sphere. Okay, uh, but this is not, and then I would also really like because I'm not an English um, native English speaker. I would really like to know more in this context about the distinction between uh, feeling and emotion in the English language, uh, you know, to and, and, and work on Lizeho or uh, try to understand uh, this double nature of feelings also through this uh, distinction. Uh, and then another small comment on this, I have enjoyed, as I, as I said, this detailed, your detailed explanation of Ching. But, uh, and I know that uh, you are working on Ching Bhante, more or less, but I also think you might explain more in a bit or uh, in detail the concept Li, which is, uh, you know, which is important from the understanding of the emotional, uh, emotion, 
emotional rational uh, structure because the interpretation of this part is also a part of uh, your topic so i think that the understanding of lee which is crucial for the conceptualization of rationality in the sense of a principle is a bit dangerous or i do a bit respectively disagree <laughs> what i have learned today um because um similar to the natural laws uh, the principle is in western thought at least how i feel it how somehow mostly comprehended as something that guides objects entities and phenomena from outside while Lee is an all-embracing structural network, in my view, of which everything, including us, are a part. So in this worldview, the human mind is also structured in accordance with this all-embracing but open um, or organic system. So the axioms of all recognition and thought, rationality, are therefore not coincidental, not completely coincidental or arbitrary, arbitrary, but follow this rationally designed uh, structure. So, and so, so the human mind is structured in a certain way, and and the external world is structured in this in, in a certain way, and the compatibility, the mutual compatibility of those two structures enables human. Uh, human perception so i would really um i would really like you to ponder a little bit i mean in the reworking of the in the preparing of of your paper uh, also on this part of the uh, of the emotional rational structure and then uh, finally my question uh, to you is since you are really you have been working a lot on this uh, emotional substance uh, uh, concept. So, uh, and you are certainly uh, so Ching Banti, and you are certain, certainly familiar also with Chan Lai's uh, Banti Lun. So, what is in your view actually the difference of these two contemporary interpretations of Chinese uh, ontology? Thank you. Thank you, Yana. Um, can I just just briefly before I dig in? That was a lot of a lot of actually very helpful um, and insightful comments. But before I, I start talking, can I can I ask you to revisit when you described um, you described it as dangerous with the, and you just misleading, misleading. Not um, not that somebody is coming and kill you, but <laughs> it can be mis it can lead to misunderstandings. Simply that. Uh, of of Li Zihou or of um, like the nature of human mind. Of what Li Zihou means in the first place. Okay, yeah, that's that's very helpful, um, and I think you're right to point out, of, of course, um, that any discussion of Qing probably should include uh, an at least some substantive consideration of Qing Li, right? Considering this is um, central. For Li Zihou as he develops this, um, mm -hmm. certainly. Um, unfortunately, you have to limit your scope somewhere, and Qing Li is one of the most difficult concepts next to Qing Benti. So, yeah. <laughs> trying to do both at the same time, um, I'll have to think a little bit about that. Um, but I liked your description of of Li as a as an organic system or, or structural network. Um, that's helpful because it is usually glossed reason. And I think that is what Professor Lee himself has in mind when he says reason, he's thinking of a structural network in a way, um, perhaps more than um, the way that we approach re reason as logic in the analytic tradition, which is mm -hmm. also to bring us back to this discussion of Qing in the Western discourse and emotions. We have a lot of work in philosophy of emotions. Um, and when we say philosophy of emotions, um, we're usually discussing it kind of a little bit overly shaped by the analytic tradition. Um, so there was quite a bit of discussion that kind of started with 
um, Amelie Rorty actually, and kind of ended with her frustrated years uh, years later of saying, God, I kicked off this whole, all of this, all of these papers and all of these discussions. And it's like, I wish I hadn't, you know, it's kind of like when Francis Cam talks about the tr trolley car problem, um, you know. Um, so it's great work, but I, I think it's less helpful than, than actually exploring this dimension of emotion as Qing, because I don't think there it's an accident that Qing has these three various meanings that in mm -hmm. English cannot cohere. They are simply separate independent things. Um, there is no connection to them. And it's striking um, to see them all combined in a single character, so to speak, um, in the Chinese language. And upon reflection, there are very good reasons for them all to be yeah. combined in a single character. Um, mm -hmm. And so those connections, I think, really help us think um, really solve a lot of philosophical problems that are created um, by, by a language that has no connection between um, emotions and feelings um, and our external circumstance and, um, and essence or facts or reality. Um, so uh, the English language scholarship on Qing is quite good, actually, I think. It helps kind of think through these. And so I was able to find quite a bit um, to discuss that very much aligns with Li Zihou's elaboration of Qing as it works in Qing Ben Ti. Um, everything from Professor Ames's work um, and Angus Graham's work to, to uh, uh, Professor Li's frequent interlocutor, Liu Yuedi, has, has great papers elaborating those connections too. Um, and so I would hope that like maybe reflection on, on why sensory experience of the external world connects of feelings and emotions to our perception and understanding of our reality in a way um, that that actually is a coherent way of thinking about things. Um, and that lacking that recognition is a source of many, much, much discussion um, among philosophers who are making it problematic. Um, and I think it does illuminate why why Qing Li would be so important, why that they are interconnected and Li Tzu is constantly arguing for their interconnection. Um, but in some ways, um, perhaps not in his original writings, but in at least in translation, he's fighting against maybe the language or our conceptual um, kind of tools that we have in a lot of ways that, that make it more difficult. Um, yeah, um, and I'm, so I'm sorry, your, your final question was about um, Chen Lai, um, yes. who, who writes his magnum opus, his most celebrated work um, in his major work of original <laughs> philosophy, right? Um, and it makes a huge splash um, when it's released. Um, and it's Renshui Benti Lun. And he says specifically um, at the beginning, at the end, and devotes an entire chapter to it, um, that it's in written and developed in response to Li Zihou's theory of Qing Ben Ti. Um, why? What's at stake? Um, Chen Lai believes that we need some sort of um, transcendent basis for reality. And that if we don't believe that there's some sort of ontological grounding beyond humans themselves to our values, that there's no values that are a structure of the cosmos um, baked into the fabric of the universe, um, then we won't be moral. We'll just fail to be good people, um, right? Um, and we can't have any morality that doesn't have these metaphysical commitments that you see um, up through Mozong San and Feng Yulan um, affirmed. And so to deny that, um, is to be anti-Confucian, to be incoherent philosophically, to just be immoral, probably. Um, and and Li Zihou's theory, for all of its greatness, has that problem. Where, it, but I mean, I think what Chen Lai doesn't even maybe recognize or take seriously is that Li Zihou's theory of Qing Benti is itself a criticism of that position. Right? It's very much formulated and put forth in contrast to the yeah. song commitments of Neo-Confucianism that are carried forward in Ch that Chen Lai is affirming. And so if you don't deal with the mo uh, Li Zihou's basic motivations and criticisms of your own position and instead just attack his position from the basis that your position is already right, um, and I, I do, uh, then you're not really effectively responding to him, although he, I, I guess you must think he is because he writes the whole chapter. Um, and it's, it's, <laughs> yeah. um, but I, 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 I am 
very proud of Professor Lee for spending so many years arguing against people who, who um, just fundamentally don't take his most important and valuable argument seriously. And I think there's a lot to be said um, to his, his theory of what the basis of morals and reason is. I don't, I don't think that we need to. And he very clearly says, um, Lee, Professor Lee believes that we can have those commitments within individual psychology, as long as we believe that right and wrong are absolute, and we will then that's, that serves the purpose. And we don't need to presume that there's some sort of unchanging fabric of the universe of values that we can't empirically see, but can somehow intuitively access. Um, right. All right, so sorry, I hope that wasn't too long, but thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Still have about 10 minutes time. So there's a raised hand both by First by, let me see, get that name right, Martina Sviacak uh, Borovi, and then by uh, Lita. Uh, yeah, I just have a very brief question uh, to Bobby about the idea of human flourishing. So uh, could you just say a little bit more about how, how rich, you know, how thick, how stable is, uh, this idea of human flourishing supposed to be, or is it supposed to be um, kind of rooted in, in more in biology, or is it also more dynamic and contingent? Thanks, Martina. Um, this is a really good question, probably the most important question for what I'm trying to propose and do with um, kind of maybe building on top of Lee's framework. And if we're gonna actually apply it as a framework to approach um, like moral and social questions, I, I have to say it's very, it, it must be contingent and dynamic. Um, it must also be founded in human biology um, because there is a material basis to all of the human flourishing. Um, and so the biology would be an important component, a foundational component, um, but certainly not the end all and be all. Um, and so in a way it, it helps move us beyond like a utilitarian framework, which would be more, I think, based in some sort of feeling of happiness um, and maybe even past a, a updated utilitarian framework that affirms higher and richer forms of pleasure over base forms of pleasure and makes a distinction in value there um, toward incorporating um, like a idea of humanity, including our thoughts, our beliefs, our practices, all of these, all of these um, qingli, right? This kind of organic structural patterning that's that's both um, conceptual and emotional at the same time, um, an integration of them. Um, so cultural practices will shift, right? And so what's valuable to humans will shift over time. And so what counts as good and what counts as flourishing will have to, will have to develop along with that. Um, which just, it, it's in some ways inherently unsatisfying, I think, because if we don't know what will be valuable in 10 or 20 or 40, 40 years. Uh, we can't know ahead of time. So in some ways, I, I fear that Lisa Ho's framework works better looking backward than forward, um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Just like the river doesn't necessarily know the shape it will take tomorrow, even if you can trace how it's developed over the last thousands of years. Um, so that would be one, one thing that I think I really need to um, think about more or try to figure out more, but it's the right question to ask. So, thank you. One more question by Professor Li, Li Chen Yang. Oh, uh, my question is also uh, for Bobby. Um, by the way, good to see you, uh, Bobby. Yeah. Um, on Qing as a bench. Now, it appears that in Li Zihou, there are two benches. On the one hand, it's a Qing bench. I, agree with your interpretation that Qing here is mostly about uh, emotion, feeling, sentiments. It's not about the reality of you know, Qinghuang. It's, it's, it's uh, Qingli, he uses Qing, uh, Qing, that is Qing. On the other hand, uh, as we discussed on the first session, uh, the comment from Wu Xiaoming, uh, it also seems to also hold that the human practice is also a bench. 
And then the idea, I think, is originally he took from Marx, is you know, the naturalized human, humanized nature. We work together through labor. We create this integrated reality, which is not merely a physical objective reality independent of human beings. And uh, so it's a creative, you know, we are part of it. And that carries a lot of weight for him. So he uh, has a, you know, his historicist, he understands morality as evolving. And based on that, uh, it is a benchy. It's a fundamental grounding of our understanding of humanity and the society. My question for you, uh, that you, you know, given you have done so much study and uh, work on this as a whole, is what's the connection between the two? You could say that Qing as Ben Qi is a component of the Qing as a human practice. But that does not seem to justify the, the amount of weight is a whole put as a Qing Ben Qi. He seems to put it even more weight on Qing Ben Qi rather than this social reality created by us. So I wonder, uh, through your study, what do you think of his these two Ben Qi? We hope it's not two dualistic Ben Qi separate, but if not, how do they come together in Li Zihong? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lee. And it's very good to see you as well. Um, that is a, a very good question. And um, I guess going back to, to Yana's question, actually, uh, to be fairer to Professor Chun Lai, um, he also brings up this criticism of Li Zihou as well. Um, and it's it on the surface of it, I think you're right. I think you put you put it in very stark terms that can be difficult to grapple with. Um, and especially if I'm if I'm talking about Qing Benti is concrete humanism and it's about human lived and felt experience. Um, well, in other places, Professor Li Zihou is very clearly affirming uh, techno social substance and Benti as as this kind of um, in the Marxian sense of kind of the condition, the material conditions and technological conditions of society. Um, and that does seem different. I, as far as I can tell at present, the only way through that problem is what you proposed, which would be to affirm that um, perhaps Qing Benti is in some way um, a component or compatible with recognition of an integrated itself in techno social substance. So that whatever the material and historical in economic conditions of human life are, um, they're only uh, fundamental or important or even themselves exist insofar as they exist for humans and shape human life. So the meaningfulness of any set of tools or any set of institutions or even any set of beliefs um, will only occur or arise within lived and felt human experience. And in this way, I think you could say that Qing Benti as the affirmation of the fundamentality of lived and felt human experience could include um, these kinds of seemingly um, different elements um, or dispersed elements such as um, technology and economic conditions um, also being part of that fundamentality. Um, and just as a note, uh, these, that's probably the most important kind of dualism that needs to be overcome here because you can only have one Benti, I think. I don't think you can have multiple Bentis. Um, but in fact, um, if you read through his various writings, there's many, many more bentis. There's so many bentis. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I, I hope that he's talking about the same thing and that can all be included in King Benti. Um, but I'd also be interested to actually go back and look um, over time, like how he changed which one he's emphasizing and maybe why, in what context he would emphasize techno-social substance. And then in, in his ethic, later ethical writings, he's emphasizing um, emotion as substance, you know. Um, okay, thank you. Yeah, That's thank the last you. sentence. Uh, my reading, again, I'm no expert, 
is that his uh, uh, social practice with the human created reality, that a theory is applicable, applicable to all societies, East and West. And Qing Wenti is, is his characterization of the Chinese culture as a result of that integrated practice. Uh, but I don't have evidence, direct quotes to support that reading. That's my overall impression. But thank you, I appreciate your presentation. No, thank you. That's a, that's a good observation. And I, I think there, there is good reason to, to understand things that way. Yeah, thanks. Well, I think we have now come to the end of our panel. And it's about time for lunch, at least for those of us that uh, live in, uh, in Middle Europe. Uh, but maybe others also deserve a break after this uh, very long uh, morning session.